holy. Well, good morning, class. <laughs> I see I didn't get any apples today, so we made it, I guess. I, uh, I do appreciate everyone being here, and as we continue in our teaching on in, as in the days of Noah, and I uh, was invited by David White uh, Friday night, Morning Star, Wilkesboro. He wanted me to come speak to their Friday night meetings and about Nephilim. And, and so I did, but I, I don't want to be known to be a, about the teacher about the Nephilim. That is, it's not what I want to be my claim to fame or whatever. Uh, but it's, it's an interesting topic, I find it, as uh, not many people want to touch it, and I know why. And since I'm a farmer, I'll try it. And so I've been over some things in the last few weeks leading up to this phenomena. It's in the days of Noah, and it, we know the Scripture uh, and the scripture is, as in the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So we are, we're, we're seeing that we're to look back so we can see forward. We're, we're to look back to give us some ideas of where we are today. And the goal and the hope is as we see where we are today, it's not to uh, it's not to bring fear or to scare us or anything like that, even though it can bring some concerning facts. That's one reason uh, we tend to not focus in on these things too much. But still, this is a prophetic class. It's a prophetic school. We tend to get on a little bit of the edgier topics, if you will. I don't claim to be a uh, total scholar on this topic, but... I'll give it my best shot. Now, some of these things I have, uh, this first couple of slides, but just to get our rhythm, our cadence back up from where we were uh, in previous teachings in this series, uh, we look at uh, Jesus gives us actually an update. He's given an update to his disciples. This is right before his crucifixion. It's Peter, James, John, and Andrew, who was Peter's brother. Now, these first eight or ten slides I'm going to go through right quickly because I've already spoken about them somewhat in weeks past. Uh, Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, therefore it's called the Olivet Discourse. And so there again, this is leading up to his crucifixion. They're asking him this question, you know, what, what, is, what are these days going to look like? Well, it just so happens that Jesus, when he just jumps right in there and gives them some of these ideas, uh, he tells them of the signs of the times, which is Matthew 24. So as we get into Matthew 24, he said this is the signs uh, of the time, and he begins there. So in the beginning of that, he gives a warning. This warning is Matthew 24, 4, 5, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Uh, that's a, you know, it's easy to, uh, to uh, get to to see, find a demon behind every bush, so to speak. Uh, we, I mean, I was raised in a time that there wasn't as many demons behind as many bushes as there are now. Let me put it that way. <laughs> they, I think they've multiplied. I, uh, because when I was growing up to get in the car and go to Statesville, which was a 12-mile ride, was going to town. You know, you went 12 miles, you and you went into town, that was maybe once a month uh, thing. And so the world's, uh, you know, we've gotten bigger quickly to all of us, but things are multiplying, things are increasing in these days that we're living. And one of the things that's going to increase is deception. So as we look as the, at, at deception, the only way we can know what deception is is to know what the real is. And where we do have an edge on the world is we do have the Holy Spirit within us. It gives us a witness uh, as, and as Christians today, this witness of the Holy Ghost, I think, is our only hope. It's our only, our only chance. And, and, of course, uh, the Holy Spirit gives us witness to the Word of God, and the Word of God gives us revelation of the times that we are in. 
So in Matthew 24, it says, As in the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, what does this really mean? Uh, now, I, we went over this. There's a little bit of introduction again about the daughters of men in Genesis 1 and 2, and it came to pass. When men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God uh, saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they, taken, and they took them to them wives in which... Uh, they chose. Now we saw that these giants are that it's it says the, uh, there were giants or Nephilim. Some translations have giants, some have Nephilim in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, and which were of old men of renown. Now we've went over the Nephilim Hebrew terms. Uh, uh, the daughters of men. We've went over all those uh, terms in, uh, last week. But we, uh, the th one thing, as we see as these uh, Nephilim, we know the Hebrew uh, word, uh, which is translated, we have Nephilim. It says that they were giants or the fallen ones to fall, cast down, and desert. Now, last week I showed you how they were, that word means they were created of God. And we know Adam was created of God. But we know that we are descendants of Adam. And we went over last week how that now when we become into the born again experience, that's what forces or creates this, forces this situation in which we have been created by God. So the born again experience, even though we are descendants of Adam, born again experience, now we discover we are created by God. Our spirit has been in this recreation, but not to reteach that. Now, it says these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man. And it says perfect in his generations. So we went over what does this word perfect mean? So there's the Hebrew word. It means without blemish or spot. So, so we see that Noah, according to God, was without blemish or, or spot. Now what that means is his genealogy was not blemished with fallen angels. And so when he gives this uh, idea in this uh, terminology that he, had, that he was perfect, so to speak. It's speaking about the bloodline. It's talking about the genetics, if you will. Because this, you see what the enemy was after with the Nephilim and the crossbreeding with the daughters of men. Uh, uh, what the enemy was after was to mess up the bloodline, the, the geome, uh, the, the genetics, if you will, of the bloodline of, of humanity with this uh, crossing. Uh, it was Satan's strategy to contaminate the bloodline. <clears throat> there again, I'm going to move quickly here. It's all about Genesis 3.15, and it says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and, and thou shalt bruise his uh, heel. So we see we got this battle of the seed, her seed, right? You see it there? Between thy seed and her seed. So, we see that the seed is an issue here. Um, this, the seed, uh, this battle, he's going to put a, there's going to be a, a space between the seed. So the idea is to keep the bloodline or the seed a pure, a pure bloodline. And so we, and the reason that's an issue is, I mean, I'm a farmer and the genetics is everything in farming, whether it's corn, your seed, or your animals, your cattle. Uh, everything we do is about genetics. And so as, as I'm growing up, 69 now, as I've seen uh, the genetic shift and change just through my short lifespan, I mean, I'm like, I'm just, it's just it's unbelievable to me. What we were always after was heirloom seed, and now we got... Uh, Genetic modified, you know, we got genetically modified seed and and cattle and and uh, so man has learned how to manipulate, if you will, the the DNA, the genetics of, of bloodlines and of seed. And you say, well, Alan, that's not a big deal. Well, uh, it's all in the it's all under the disguise, if you will. I, I hate to use the word disguise. Um, it's all under the idea of creating things that are better. And, and it's kind of like a coin. <laughs> it's all about the money. It's like a coin. It has two sides. It has a, it has a good side, and, and it, it can have a good side, and it ha can have a, a bad side to it. And uh, so there's a lot of things uh, 
like in, in breeding cattle, you're always breeding up for certain traits. You get good feet and legs, udder, their back, tailbone, uh, line, all of these things uh, to create a good frame. Uh, the better frame the animal has, the longer it lasts. And so you're, 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 we're kind of we're manipulating genetics somewhat, but we were doing it by the breed, the, the bull that you bred the cow to. And so, so it's not that we haven't been in some types of, of manipulation, but the nip, manipulation is getting beyond some borders. And we're going to get into those if you'll endure with me. I definitely test everything I'm saying today because we're going to go on out on a limb. So titans in Greek mythology, real quickly, I'm just going to skip over it but quickly, but titans in the Greek mythology were the offspring of Greek gods cohabitating with women. They, they called them demigods or half god, half man. You can say, well, Alan... What's that got to do with anything? Because in, 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 in Greek religion, the, we call it a, it's a, like a mythology, but the idea was it's like the Nephilim. And, and, and actually the word for, for these Greek gods uh, was Nephilim. And it, that's the, kind of the amazing part. But it, it's a cross between a spirit and a man, a cross between a god and a man, in this Greek mythology, and it's, you're calling them demigods. And we went over that in the last few weeks about all the movies that we're having today about uh, the Marvel movies and all that. It's, it's, I mean, it's all out in front of us. Of course, we think, well, it's just a movie. I think it has a lot to do with, um, with uh, um, blurring lines. Uh, I think it has a lot to do with it, 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 it. I don't have any problem with anybody watching a Marvel movie, but... I am trying to say that the world that we're living in is not friendly and we're constantly having our minds bent to what we, is acceptable and what's not acceptable. And it's done subtle. You know, it's done in the mind. It's done subtly on what causes us to start blurring lines. Um, so there, in Greek titans, uh, uh, which is part uh, terrestrial or earthly and part celestial, which is heavenly. Uh, they, now, this is the Greek mythology, as they rebelled against their father, Uranus. Uh, after a long battle, they were defeated by Zeus. He was the, the main winner of that. In Greek mythology and the Hebrew, they are called Nephilim. So I think that's, that's interesting because it's a cross between uh, what they were saying was a god and uh, human. They were called supernatural offspring or mighty men. Now, in Genesis 3, 4, we got to look at this one part. It says, and the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man uh, for that he also is flesh, but yet his day shall be 120 years. There were giants or Nephilim in the earth in, they, in those days. Uh, and then it says, also after that. Now, also, so we were thinking, you know, the Nephilim, were destroyed by the flood. But then we got this part of the verse here. It says, also after that. So that lets us know and allows us this understanding that there were Nephilim also after that or, or after the flood. And uh, so after that uh, means it did not end uh, all of that type of activity. And, of course, we know it didn't because we know, we know of Goliath, uh, the sons of, of, of Adon. And so, so we can see there was a giant, there were big, uh, big humans, and I went over a lot of the artifacts that we have, bones and whatever, uh, last week about uh, these, these giants. Now, but we can't limit a Nephilim to a giant. So, so we know a lot of them were giants, but we can't, uh, you can't walk around and say every big person's a Nephilim, right? Somebody's is really tall, oh, there's a Nephilim, you know. Yeah, that's not the way it works. It, it just so happens that, and usually Nephilim were, were, I think they perceive, I don't, Goliath, I don't remember, 11, 12 feet or something. But there are a lot of uh, bones and thigh bones of humans and all of this that we know that people have probably got 20 feet or more. We don't know. Um, but all that's interesting, and that's more than science and all that. Um, but as the Philistines moved closer to attack, Dave, attack him, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet him, reaching into his bag, Taken out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. A stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David uh, triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. 
Uh, David ran, stood over him, took a hold of the Philistine's sword, drew it out of his sheath. He killed him. He cut his head off with the sword. I freak, it just hit in my brain. Did David pick up four stones or five stones? Five? Picked up five stones, yeah. And, and, and I think, of course, I might be corrected on this. It's just, it just came to my brain. I think the, uh, the genealogy, I think David, I think Goliath had four other brothers. Is that correct? Yeah, okay. Yeah, Goliath had four other brothers, so David picked up enough stones for the rest of them, you see. But it's a good thing he, was, he knew he was a good shot, didn't he? Because he knew it would just take one. But, but still, yet that family, there, were, there, were, uh, uh, there was that. So now we got the post-flood or the Nephilim. We got the report, report of the spies, and we all know about this in Numbers. There were, we saw giants of Anak, which come from the giants, and we are in our own sight as grasshoppers. So we were in their sight in Numbers 14. All the congregation lifted up their voice, and you know the story, and the people wept that night. Uh, uh, children of Israel murmured against Moses, against Aaron, and the whole God, congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or God would have let us died in the wilderness. So we know that they went in, the spies went into the land. Um, they said there were these giants. Uh, they said they, they looked like grasshoppers to them. So, uh, you know, if, if you want to take that in proportion, I don't know that you could, but if you, did, if you could, that's, they were some pretty big uh, giants there. Now I'm going to, uh, as we got through that, I'm going to go into a topic that everybody loves to talk about. It's called transhumanism. And uh, y'all notice I like to stay out of the controversial stuff. So, uh, but, but something that we need to consider uh, because we are living as in the days of Noah. And, it, and I'm using this terminology. It's, it's a, a term that's used. Uh, and one reason I thought this week I, I felt like the Lord wanted me to pick up on this topic is uh, the word trans is being used a lot these days, right? It's trans everything. And uh, so it, it, it led me, I could feel, if you would, if I could say, or I could sense how this word trans was being used as a, a spiritual term uh, of the dark side uh, because in the scriptures it says we're being transformed, right? So the counter, the counter uh, to, to that is the trans, whatever you want to go in transgender, go into trans, everything. That, that we're using this terminology these days. And so as we see, as we get into, so to try to cover the whole gamut of uh, this trans stuff, the enemy, Satan himself, always has a counterfeit. He is, Satan really doesn't have a plan. He's trying to follow God. What, what Satan tends to do is he follows God's plan, but he turns it evil because he, he can't come up with his own plan. So he duplicates God's plan, then he makes it dark, and, and then he, he issues it. And so as we, are, as we know with this new creation that we now are being created by God, and we're being transformed into his likeness, and then the enemy on the dark side in this day, as in the days of Noah and what we're living in, he's picked up on this word trans, and he said, okay, I'm going to use transform as a way of darkness, as, as a way of wickedness. And, but, but then you've got to understand, how do you change the word trans? How... How can you take it from light to dark? Well, there has to be what, what I, it appears to me, usually there's a place of transition. There's, it's not, and that's what reason I say when you get into a situation of blurred lines, it's usually not God. God is, is, is defines things. God, God is, uh, um, he's, things are defined with more with God. Uh, they aren't blurred. And that's the reason I say in the prophetic, with the, the greatest gift in the prophetic to, for us to exercise and to try to use, you've got to understand you've got to exercise, you've got to use it, uh, is, is the ability uh, to tell the difference in something. You, you, you've, you've, got to make, you've got to have this gift of distinction, I call it. You've got to be able to make a distinction uh, uh, between what's God and what's not God. And to me, that's more of a gift of the Spirit. We ask God to give this gift to be able to make a distinction. When you come to the scriptures, there's nothing but distinctions. Um, a lot of places in scripture that people make a big mistake is they don't make a distinction between the church and Israel, for instance. You, and, and to not make that distinction, 
it, it will lead you and you'll miss some understanding in the scripture. So as we get into transhumanism, uh, and I must uh, hurry here, uh, I'm, we're going to call it the new hybrids in, in transhumanism. And uh, so let's just look, if you will, just kind of hang on to your seats. Don't judge me if you would. Just take a glimpse. Test everything. <laughs> and uh, I will enjoy myself as I present it to you. So there, what is transhumanism? Uh, transhumanism is a social and philosophical movement devoted to promoting the research and development of robust human enhancement uh, technologies. Such technology would, uh, uh, would augment or increase human sensory reception. You see that? Uh, the emotive ability or cognitive capacity as well as the radically improve human health and extend human lifespan. So transhumanism, this idea of transhumanism is to improve. It, was, it almost has a noble cause. I mean, a lot of it's against disease and and. Uh, uh, limbs, if you have lost a limb. Uh, to, to, so transhumanism, is, it, it's casting this idea of an improvement. Uh, I'll go as far as to say this. It's casting this idea of an upgrade. Now, uh, I mean, who's not for that? Who's not for an upgrade? I, I'm 69. I could use a few myself. But, but I'm going to wait on my new body. I, th I think. I mean, I will go to the doctor and some things, but um, anyway, let's move on. Uh, now, transhumanism is uh, genetic. Uh, genetically, it's the genetics is the scientific study of genes and heredity of how certain qualities of, or traits are passed from parents to offspring as the results of changes in the DNA sequence. And so, I'm not a scientist. Don't claim to be. I'm not a biologist. I'm sure Dr. Craig could handle this a whole lot better than me. I'm a, a dairy farmer that knows just enough to plant corn and breed cows. So that's that, it's coming out of this. So, so it's it's um, I don't claim to be uh, to know too much about it, but I know just enough to be dangerous, I guess. So now you've got what we call microbiology. Now microbiology. It's a study of the biology of microscopic organisms, viruses, bacteria, algae, fungi, slime molds, and protozoa. So we've, we're, we're in this day and time of, of, of microbiology, of this huge, huge world of genetics. Now, you, you've got to understand, all of these things that I'm about to show you affects us as humans. It, the science of it and the, and the study of it is for our good. It's not against us, it's for good. Now, robotics, yeah, I do, uh, even on the farm, it's amazing my whole uh, milking parlor is run by robots. The whole, the, uh, in my bagging facilities where we uh, bag our potty mixes and things, uh, robots stack the pallets. And so I'm, I'm, I'm so integrated with robots and the genetic, genetic scenes and the microbiology because of all the viruses and, I mean, we're totally, when the vaccine came around, you know, uh, the jab, I think, was the great word it incurred. Um, every, you know, there was a lot of pros and cons, about as many cons as pros, and, and everybody's scared of a COVID uh, vaccine, but yet I'd been giving COVID vaccines to cattle for 20 years. So I'm like, I, I, I don't know what the big deal is. But when I got COVID, I thought, yeah, it's a pretty big deal. So I, I was definitely... <laughs> Well, I, I got it better when I got COVID, but uh, so I've had COVID and I've had two shots and I had uh, COVID again after my shots. So I've got all the bases covered. But when you get into robotics, that's a huge part. And you say, well, Alan, how's that uh, got anything to do with trans uh, transhumanism? Well, just uh, go with me here a minute. And then, we, then we got AI. Uh, AI refers to systems or machines that mimic human intelligence to perform tasks uh, and can improve themselves based on the information they collect. collect. Now, those definitions, of course, I, uh, are my, my definitions. Those are more scientific definitions. But that's the definition of some things that are, are, are contributing 
to this uh, trans uh, situation we find ourselves in. So we're in, as in the days of Noah, but we are birthed and born in a time that these things are expanding quickly. And so they're around us and it's happening. And I mean, come on, you talk to your telephone and you ask for a phone number and a lady on the other end talks to you, right? I mean, you know, tell my grandpa that and he'd say he was crazy. So, so we're living in a, of course, you, you acclimate to it. We get used to everything that's around us. You know, we say, well, this is normal. We've acclimated to it. And there's a lot of it I think it's good to acclimate to, but I'm not sure that it's all quite as convenient as it is looking because of the long-term uh, consequences. Now, oh, mercy, I'm not getting anywhere. Now, I, now I'm going to get into animal and human hybrids. Uh, uh, of course, I'm into the hybrids of uh, the breeding of the cattle and all that, but I'm not into this one too much. <laughs> uh, you see, now there again, and uh, you call the, can anybody pronounce that uh, word there? Chimera, chimera. That's that would be it. Yeah, chimera, chimera. Uh, in Greek mythology, is a fire-breathing female monster in a lion's head and a goat's body and a serpent's tail. So. You know, we'd look at that and laugh, of course, and say, well, you know. But there again, it's in Greek mythology, and uh, I always understand that the enemy is trying to duplicate, and uh, he always goes dark with it. Uh, the funny thing to me in, in, in this uh, um, chimera here, that it is, it, it's, it's in a three-person uh, tri- triune thing there, so... Scientists have created sheep that are beginning to grow human hearts and livers uh, with uh, gene modification. How many people are aware of that? You know, there again, you're, if you're in agriculture, you keep up with these things a little bit more. Now, have they been totally successful? That the answer is no. But have they crossed uh, the human? Uh, they now have uh, a sheep, two sheep's heart in the lab. Oh, not hearts, uh, lungs in a lab, and I've watched them for several years, just the research on it, and those lungs are there breathing in a test tube, if you will, but it's about that big, you know, and these lungs are in there. You can go online and see it. And they're sitting there. Uh, these sheep's lungs, they have got them now where they will uh, auctionate uh, human blood. Through, through j- j- changing the gene pattern, DNA. So it will accept... Now, is it perfected? The answer is hugely no. Uh, But is the research and development moving fast? It's just just incredible. So, uh, well, I mean, how many people's got a pig valve in their heart? You know, I'm not trying to say that's bad. You know, if it's kept you alive, it's probably a pretty good deal. But but there again, the idea is you got, what I'm after here is the idea, not if it's, Accomplishing good or accomplishing bad, it's it's how that our minds are are, are turned, how it's trans, how the trans, the trans thing. When you hear tra- trans uh, vestite or trans, whatever you want to do, what you got to understand, it's messing with your mind, and it's a, and you're bringing defin, you're allowing definition to be acceptable, and that's the reason these gray these gray areas that a lot of Christians are are in now. Uh, what it means that they are into situations that they are accepting the doctrines of demons, as far as I'm concerned. Now, you got yeah, there. I've, I put it up there. I didn't. A human pig hybrid was created in the lab, uh, has lungs that filter human blood. Uh, scientists hope that the uh, Chimera embryos represent key steps towards life saving uh, lab grown organs. And you know, how many people need organ transplants and they can't get them? I mean, Heart transplants, I think there's just very few to those that need it. Most people die waiting on a heart transplant. So we could all say, well, that would be wonderful. But we also know now in certain countries, probably China, that they're not duplicating, but they're having what they're calling organ harvesting, where they're actually uh, killing people to get their organs. And So we've got the transplant things going on. But anyway, they have good intentions, but few safeguards. Now, that's the part that'll get you because I'm in agriculture and I'm in all this stuff and we're creating uh, all this stuff. And, 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 uh, but the safeguards, in other words, when I plant GMO corn, if I plant 12 rows in a planter, 
Three of those rows have to be heirloom corn, which means it's original corn, not manipulated. All right, three. Then nine of those rows will be GMO corn. Now, I have to sign a document that if I don't do that, I can be fined $100,000 and up for uh, a minimum of five years in prison, up to 10 years in prison, if I don't do that. Do you all hear what I just said? That affects my life pretty big. And you say, well, Alan, don't plant GMO. I can't get that much heirloom corn. We got about three people that own all the seeds of the world, whether you know it or not. I'm sorry. I, uh, I'm talking about it in a large scale. Now, you can get a little heirloom seed on the Internet that this little farm's doing, you know, save this. But so, so I have to sign a document, a legal document, saying that that's how I'll plant it. Now, the reason is, is three rows. They're wanting the GMO you can take a GMO stalk of corn and a corn earworm can get on it. It can eat it and it'll die and fall off. You take heirloom corn, corn earworm, go up there and go in the top, it'll eat up a third of the, third of the year. What they're wanting to do is to keep enough corn earworms alive so genetically they don't alter themselves. They're trying to keep the gene pool with the worm messed up because that worm will mutate Give it two to three years, and that genetic modification won't work with that corn earworm because a corn earworm can adapt and change quicker than you can do your gene modifications. Isn't that interesting? But it's scary. <laughs> and, of course, you can ask this question. Well, what does that do to the corn? Well, we don't know yet. Well, the science in years to come will tell us. <laughs> wow. So I can stand here and say that there's, not, there's not as many safeguards as you'd think. And not only that, you can get these genetic codes online, most of them for free. Anybody in their garage can do these modifications. If you're, if you're, you got to be smarter than me, but there's a lot of people smarter than me, but you can actually get these, geo, uh, these gene streams. And, and uh, so you, you can do it yourself. So you don't mean to tell me that the enemy can't have its people out there messing with this stuff? You know, we, we sit back and think, well, you know, it's under lab control and the universities are doing it. And I, I, Yes, that's happening, but there's a lot of other stuff happening. That, are you scared yet? I'm not trying to scare you. but anyway. Well, I, I'm saying things I probably shouldn't even say. I don't, Because a lot of what I'm saying also is speculation. Uh, but I'm, I think so. You can use genetics as a weapon. Now, I'm doing as in the days of Noah. It's 17 minutes after 10 I do have a happy ending to this, but you're probably not going to get it today. <laughs> so I'll give you my apology up front. So you can use genetics as a weapon. <laughs> now here, here it is. The, the Nebula uh, Gemonics offer uh, free whole uh, genome sequencing to customers willing to allow their data to be used by researchers for drug development. Uh, clinical laboratory leaders uh, in atomic uh, pathologists will agree they off the GMs. There you go, sequencing to customers for free is unique uh, in the direct to consumer DTC genetic marketing. So, do you have to pay for it? No, no, you don't have to pay for it. They'll give it. They'll give it to you if you're a researcher in your garage at home. Just as long as they have access to your data. Data. So that's how they're trying to spread out the research and all that. I, I'm just saying uh, that's that's just that don't seem very safe to me. So who has access to the uh, human genome uh, data? The DNA sequence of the human genome is now freely accessible to all for public or private use from the National Center of uh, Biotechnology Information, the NCBI. So there you go. Uh, now, terrorists could develop a pathogen that could target humans. Uh, and there again, I'm not trying to make a case for anything. I'm just throwing you out information and you and the Holy Spirit do something with it. Now, it, it, and there again, it's not my fault. As in the days of Noah is what the Bible said, and that's what's got me into this stuff. As it is in the days of Noah, and my job, the problem with being a prophetic teacher is my job is I have to teach you these things or I have to present them to you and then you, you do with it what you will. Now, terrorists could develop a pathogen that could target humans. A biological attack is, is the intention, intentional release of a pathogen, disease-causing agent, or biotoxin. 
poisonous substance produced by a living organism against human plants or animals. And that's not my definition. That's the definition of the United States government right there. An attack against people could be used to cause illness, death, fear, social disruption, or, and economic change. An attack on agricultural plants and animals would primarily cause economic damage, loss of confidence in the food supply, and possible loss of life. Now, we can see with the, with the war in Ukraine, how well, we've got one little war somewhere, not a little war, but we've got a war somewhere that doesn't affect hump, it's not around me, but yet it's, it's um, Ukraine ships 30 to 40% of the, of the wheat in that part of the world. And so all of a sudden now we see, well, I mean, it, as I told you before, corn was two to seventy-five, three dollars $3 a bushel a year and a half ago. Um, now it's $9 for corn. Wheat, uh, $3, three fifty, dollars uh, now 10 to $11. And you say, how is, it that, how is it that fragile? How does it change that quickly? Well, what's happened in globalism? Globalism causes everybody to depend on everybody. And so uh, all of the major globalists own ships. They own these huge ships that ship everything across the oceans. If you get a map of it and see the locator of all the ships that's out there, it looks like a bunch of ants on an anthill. They own all these huge ships, and uh, the, the greatest profit is in shipping what's being shipped. That's where the greatest profits is and all that, but that's another, another story. So um, what's that got to do with pathogens? I don't know. So we got, now let's move on to artificial intelligence here. Uh, with AI, what it does is it blurs the distinctions between man and machine. Now, anytime you're getting into... And I've talked, as I said before, the key thing to the prophetic is you can make distinctions. The key thing about God's word is you don't give up this giftingness of distinctions. That's important. Uh, racism as an, as, a, as an idea is trying to, people are trying, there are distinctions in races. That, that's, that's, that's not bad. Uh, that's good. Uh, but you got to make the distinction. So with all of this, political correctness, what it's trying to do is erase distinctions which will make you feel like you're going crazy, right? In other words, well, no, you're, nothing's just, you mean I can't say this is that or that's it? But, the, but I want you to see what it's trying to do to our minds. It's trying to do away with the prophetic giftiness of the Holy Ghost which you have to use and it's the ability to make a distinction. That's all I'm saying. And so as all of this blurredness is out here, and everybody starts second-guessing themselves, and that's what happens to us with the Word of God. The Word of God is distinct. It's powerful, and it says what it says and means what it says where it says it. So the, the, the key thing, and now what happens with AI, it starts blurring distinctions between man and, and machine. I'm going to go over just a few of them right quick. I knew you wanted me to. Now, robots will be able to do everything better than us. Musk, anybody know who his first name is? said, during his speech, I have exposure to the most cutting edge, AI, and I think people should uh, be really concerned about it. You see, and that's Elon Musk, but it you know, wasn't long, then he's, now he's got him a robot factory. But um, Now, Elon Musk's latest uh, vision for the future is linking human brains with computers via brain chip. I know you've all heard about that, haven't you? He, 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 uh, he has developed now brain chip, the don't put it in the brain. I think it's kind of under the skin at the skull. And they've got, somehow or another, he's got it figured out that how you think can be transmitted or something to this chip, and you can go to a computer. Elon Musk warned of a Terminator-like AI apocalypse if we weren't careful. Uh, no kidding. Elon Musk's brain chip from newer link lines up clinical trials in humans, implants that Musk says could allow paralyzed people to walk, have already test, been tested on a pig and a monkey, on a monkey and a pig. So, I mean, that's for a good reason, and, and, it's, a, and it's a good cause. And, and you, you can say, well, I don't know what. You see, the problem is something good in the hands of someone evil is, turns what's good into what's bad. So today in our society, and, and in the days of Noah, what was good is now called bad, and what was bad is now called what? It's, it's called good. So we got to understand this world that we're living in and what's happening uh, 
all, all around us. Now, I, that person, I kind of like Elon Musk. I, I, uh, I just rejoiced when he bought Twitter. And, uh, but I got this re- reservation way down deep in my soul. I hope he doesn't get killed and, and is resurrected or something. So, well, I just hope that doesn't happen. Now, uh, could this uh, produce a demonic entry is my question. Could, could a, a chip in the brain or uh, the, the genetics, uh, uh, AI, could all of this stuff equal, I, I'll ask you the question, could it equal a, a demonic entry? Because uh, y'all know my background, the mental hospitals with my mother and all of that. And so I, demonic entry is important to me because it, I see what it can do to all of us. And uh, well, wow, well, my mind went somewhere. Come back here, Alan. Now, could this produce a demonic entry is the question. Most scientists have no understanding of biblical theology or demonology. There's, there's a problem right there. And we can say, well, we don't require them to have that. They can just be sciences. Well, it, it makes a huge difference because that doesn't go into their thinking system, their thinking tank. The ultimate goal is to create a so-called pathway towards immortality. See, now that's the problem. You see what I'm saying? They're trying to, trying to keep updating the human. Where we are in the days that the technology and everything's trying to update everything to a better version, whether it be corn, wheat, animals, humans. We want to update to a better version. Does it sound like it's trying to mimic being born again? You see, we already have the better version. And, and we're going to get the upgrade of the new body too. Do you know that? We're going to get the upgrade. But, but the dark side's trying to put that into motion now. It's not trying. It's putting that into motion now. And that, I don't want that, that to cause us fear, but I want us to know what we're looking at. Because if you know what you're looking at, you'll trust this book more and more. The more you see reality, the more you'll trust this book. That's the reason the enemy's trying to blur reality. So that we don't trust the book. He's trying to cause us to quit. Well, this is kind of a gray area. But say, God, you think this is a gray area? I wonder what his response would be. He, he, he'd, he'd probably just look at us and shake our head. Now, so he's trying to create this pathway uh, to, towards immortality. That's the idea. Uh, the next web article here, uh, the next web, that's a, actually a paper a magazine, if you will, is about metaverse. Anybody heard about metaverse? There is a new culture arising. Now, this is the article in this, in this magazine. Uh, there is a new culture arising between man and machine. The digital afterlife, avatars, we created uh, throughout the years. Photos and accounts we accumulate, contacts, messages we exchange. is changing our aspirations about life and death. So here, if you, they have created a life after death avatar. So you put all of your informations of who you are in this metaverse, get you an avatar, it looks like you, and all of that's stored forever, so your offspring down the generations to come can meet you in the metaverse and talk with you. Dang. They're calling it a life after death. Join the metaverse. Live forever. Now, what they're tapping into or what their creators are thinking is, is your conscious mind, your consciousness is the real you. This, this, is, this isn't cartoons here, okay? What they're tapping into is you're, they're trying to capture your consciousness. And they're believing that they can capture it through like a metaverse, afterlife. So it's about immortality. Can you see that? So all of this stuff that's happening is about the enemy and the immortality. Being like the Greek gods or whatever, we can laugh about all we want to, but it's not nothing to laugh about. Now, here's the article title. You need to start planning for immortality in the metaverse. Here, here's, a, here's a, the subheading. Death is a field we rather leave untouched, yet it is death that touches us all. I thought, well, you got that one right. <laughs> but yet it's death that, touch, that touches us all. Now, maybe I've got time to do one more. <coughs> the goal is to blur reality into a virtual reality. 
You hear that term all the time, virtual. So the goal, there's a goal, is to turn reality into a virtual reality. So everything you're new, a transgenderism is, is a virtual reality. You're, you're trying to create a, a new reality. It's all couched under culture, right? But, and culture is a type of reality, I guess, but that's what it's being couched under. So here we go. Virtual meaning is almost or nearly, but not completely or according to strict definition. That, that's, that's what virtual means. Now, a counterfeit meaning made in exact imitation of something valuable or important with the intention to deceive or defraud. <laughs> It's not much difference in the two. I don't know if you know sir. So, so what? I, so we got this term, uh, and I'm, I wish I had time. I, I'm out of time now. But if you, you know, Facebook was just turned into the the meta, right? Look up the word meta. Just do a little meta study. What does meta mean? And and uh, you, it, it, so you're like, oh my gosh. I mean, I find myself studying, and as in the days of Noah, and I'm like, God, I wish I could. Can I not just leave it to that verse, as in the days of Noah? And it's like God, and they said, no, Alan, you got to be aware. You got to, I, I'm saying, yeah, this is my conversation with God. But God, I'm, I'm going to show people this, and, and I'm either going to make some afraid, uh, or some's going to say you're crazy, or uh, some's going to say it's that. And he said, well, just trust me, uh, them, with the Holy Spirit. So uh, my report to you today, to leave you hanging here, there again, there is some good stuff to come. Uh, but to leave you hanging here, I'll just lay it on your lap between you and God, between you and the Holy Spirit to do with it with, uh, with what you will. So that's not anything that we'll shout about perhaps, but that's my story and I'm going to stick to it. we got a friend here with us today, Dr. Bill Jones. Jones. He is sitting right here with his wonderful wife, and I apologize, I don't know her name. Debbie. Debbie. Apologize, Debbie. Truth is, if I'd have known it, I'd probably forget. I, I don't do good with names anyway. Uh, but we're, ha- we're glad to have them here today. Uh, uh, Dr. Jones is, and I uh, are together are going to be uh, working with Park Avenue uh, Church in Florida as, as, uh, to help the leaders there, um, and hopefully we can do that, or they can help us. It, I'm sure it'll go two ways. And, uh, but he's going to be speaking with us today. We're honored to have him. He was, uh, um, he was um, president of, of uh, Columbia International University uh, for 10 years, I think it was, wasn't it? Uh, for 10 years uh, and uh, that uh, Bible college there. And we're honored to have him here today. His, his, as I uh, got to know him, he is big heart is, uh, is missions and starting churches. Got another mission organization. How many churches now have they started? 3,094 3, churches. Wow. 3,094 churches. Wow. Uh, that, that messed up my matter of reality. Um, but he's going to be speaking to us here in the next service. So let's stand. And oh, yeah, he's got a book. That's where I was going. Putting together the puzzle of uh, the Old Testament. He's got a book table out front. Uh, I think Steve will be mentioning something there also. So let's stand and I'll uh, close. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for this day. And Lord God, I do ask and pray that your Holy Spirit would be with us in this service. Lord, you know our deal. If there's anything that I've said that was incorrect, not of you, I pray it'll fall to the ground. But Lord Jesus, if I've said anything that's of you, or of your spirit, anything you'd have us to be aware of, but Lord, I pray that you will uh, give us understanding by the witness of your spirit. Let those things that are of you be quickened to our hearts. Those things that are not fall to the ground. Lord God, we love you. We thank you for your word, for your truth, and your way. Be with us as we go into the worship time and, and, to, the, and to the next message. And it's our prayer, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit, your Holy Spirit, O oh God, will so permeate this place that not a lost person could stay here unsaved and not a disease could stay here and not be healed is our prayer for your habitation not just visitation to be in this house in Jesus name amen and amen